On the slow train from midsummer northern and Mummy Road. No churns, no porter, no cat on a seat. Beeching's report would change the map of Britain for good. We won't be meeting again on the slow train. Over 200 branch lines were to be closed. More than 2,000 stations shut down and 5,000 miles of track would be pulled up. They've all passed out of our lives on the slow train. There's never been a doomsday book of British railways like this. Remote areas of the Highlands will lose their services Wales takes a body blow as well. In the northeast, little more than the main north-south links will remain. Holiday resorts in the west country share the fate of many market towns. No station, no passenger trains. And North Devon and North Cornwall resorts are especially hit. Attend the long express from Waterloo that takes us down to Cornwall. On Waybridge Station, what a breath of sea scented the Camel Valley. Cornish air, soft Cornish rains and silence after steam. Thanks to the train, the southwest coastline had become the prime location of the English bucket and spade holiday. This is a charming poster from the early 1960s showing all the seaside resorts that you could get to direct from Waterloo on the glamorous sounding Atlantic Coast Express. But after Beeching had done his work, all these stations were closed and you couldn't get to any of these towns by rail. The North Cornish village of Padstow depended on its trains. The railway had arrived here in 1899 and immediately revolutionised the local economy, carrying fish out and tourists in. Over 60 years on, the track which had brought such prosperity to Padstow was carried off for scrap. At the old station, there is now a car park. And along the old coastal route, the views are only enjoyed by walkers and the occasional cyclist. When the railway went, it was the workers on the local lines who were hit first. I met up with Trevor Knight and Rod Thompson, who'd found their jobs under threat. I don't think there was a case to do what he did this part of the world, just cut it right out and isolate everybody, because that's what it did, like, you know. Do you think their research into numbers was scientific and rigorously done? It's the same old story. If you see somebody stranger in the camp, you think, well, what's he doing? Yeah. Why has he got a clipboard? <laughs> Used to see him get off a train and they'd be watching the see who got on and off. And when we were observing all yeah. this, it was at a time when there, there was less people travelling, like like midday or something like that, rather than in the mornings when there was people going to work, yeah. uh, children going to schools, various places. So <laughs> are you suggesting it was a fix? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are people who suggest that the figures were collated um, by going to railway stations when they weren't very busy and going at off-peak times rather than at the commuter rush or when schools were coming out. <laughs> Absolute rubbish. <laughs> you say that very confidently. <laughs> I do say it confidently. Absolute rubbish. It's extremely unlikely that surveys were rigged, but in fact there was a generally hurried approach to analysing the results and there wasn't a great deal of thought given to should we do another survey at another time? Should we look at how we can cut costs, have initiatives to increase traffic? 
I remember the division manager at Plymouth wrote a letter with a very, very good plan for the Exmouth line. And the reply he got, which came from headquarters, was it is not the job of the divisional manager to tell us how to run the railway it's efficient, efficiently, it's to close it down. Closing hundreds of lines meant cutting thousands of jobs. Railway workers were devastated. John Betjeman added his voice to the protests. You know, I'm not just being nostalgic and sentimental and unpractical about railways. They're not a thing of the past. And it's heartbreaking to see them left to rot and to see the fine men who served them all their lives made uncertain about their own futures and about their jobs. I think it's more than likely that we'll deeply regret the branch lines we've torn up and the lines that we've let to go to rot. The travelling public joined the mounting opposition. It's a very sad thought, you know, to, to us that some uh, boffin boy at grimy old Liverpool Street, some economist, uh, may be the means of closing down this eight miles of very nice line merely for the sake of balancing his books. It's uh, a nationalised in industry, and if it is losing money, it's, a, uh, it's only a drop in the ocean compared with other industries, and it's an essential service that, uh, well, I think we're entitled to. Dissatisfaction was escalating. Beeching acted swiftly by stepping up the PR campaign. He requested help from an unlikely source. BBC Television presents Tony Hancock in... <sighs> Hancock's Half Hour. <laughs> oh, I hate train journeys. I always have. They drive me up the wall, train journeys do, hour after hour. Clickety-clack, clickety-clack, biggly-bong, biggly-bong. Clickety-clack, clickety-clack, biggly-bong. Biggly 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 <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is not they're going on a different train for a start. Another thing I hate about train journeys, passengers. Every time I travel by train, I get mixed up with the most ugly looking lot of geezers you've ever seen in your life. Excuse me. Thank you very much. The lugubrious Tony Hancock was one of Britain's best loved comedians. Although Dr. Beeching's sense of humour was hardly legendary, he now dispatched his publicity officer to get Hancock on board. Whose little one's this then? Oh, that's mine. That cat's <laughs> I said, well, how much would you want for it? Well, he said, Dr. Beeching is paid 24,000 a year. I want the same. <laughs> I said, I'll give you half. <laughs> and did you take Done. it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking forward to this at all. <laughs> Hancock fronted a spoof investigation. Sparing no expense, celebrity photographer Terence Donovan took the pictures, which ran as a campaign in national newspapers. This advert was called The Train That Wasn't, and it's about cuts in services. Hancock complains, all oh, that beaching, look what he's done now. Remove my favourite train from the service 29 minutes after midnight. Very cosy too, only one passenger per carriage. You can cut what trains you like, but you can't cut mine, I said to Beeching. The official railway's response runs underneath. At present, some trains run almost empty. These services lose the railway's large sums of money, waste manpower and equipment. Economies must be made. The few people affected may have to use other forms of transport or travel earlier. There's no evidence the costly Hancock report convinced anybody of anything. The death of their railways was no laughing matter to those at the sharp end of the cuts. Especially when Beeching's faith in alternative transport seemed excessively optimistic. I've had an idea, he said. Do you think you can provide me with a map of every bus service in this country showing the coverage nationally? We put it as an appendix. Yes, it's here. And if you look at that map, 